Chairs, Peter, uh, Ken and Fintan Sly. Um, I can assure you I've no intention of going through all those slides. Um, some of them are just um, information in many ways and what I really want to do today is um, both underline, I think the message that we have had already this morning, which is the collective endeavor that this is. This is about, um, while energy might be at the heart of so much of the climate change agenda, it is an endeavor in a global sense, in a national sense, and in a European sense that requires all aspects of the economy, all aspects of society to um, pull together as one. And in terms of, of energy, um, in terms of the national collective endeavor around energy, um, just to maybe uh, remind us all that we do intend to um, produce a new energy policy framework uh, by the end of the year. Um, and in the context of policy certainty, um, such a statement of, of direction is hugely important. It will also mark the uh, momentous, indeed in some ways catastrophic changes since 2007, and is a good moment at which to um, embark on, on setting some of those new directions. Now, I've just thrown up those. Those are no surprise to anyone uh, in this room. But just in terms of where we're at, um, 2010, the gross final energy use from renewable energy was 5.5%. Now, that's getting, an, you know, this is where we need to be. Um, there have been significant developments, but it's still a huge challenge, um, particularly around the heating, and I'll come back to transport. Electricity, 15% um, installed capacity. And I think Fintan, correct me if I'm wrong, but on Christmas Day, we had around 42% wind on the system all day, which was, which was uh, if nothing else, a remarkable vindication of the All Island Grid study, uh, which, which noted 42%. Anyway, one of the things that I just thought should be worth touching on today, and it's as much to kind of provoke a bit of discussion as anything else, is are Europe's legally binding targets paying off in the renewable energy sphere? Um, and maybe just to start with reminding ourselves that Ireland's policy, energy policy set firmly in the European Union and in the global and international context, um, we have had over the last five years an array of seminal strategy and policy documents from the European Commission. We have had uh, uh, successive endorsements by the European Council of the need to put energy policy at the heart of both economic policy and climate change. Um, we will have uh, the new communication on renewable energy from the Commission later this year which I would envisage will be uh, an item for, for much interesting discussion during the Irish presidency in the first half of 2013. And we have the current work on the Energy Efficiency Directive, um, which uh, our Danish colleague, colleagues currently in the presidency are um, moving ambitiously ahead, building on, I have to say, the, the very excellent work done by the Polish presidency uh, towards the end of last year. Um, and I would say that energy efficiency which is part of the session to follow with my esteemed colleague Brian Motherway uh, leading off. Energy efficiency is the most fundamental part of all of this. Um, and we haven't even begun uh, in global terms to realize the potential uh, in that sphere. Um, the door to two degrees is closing. The International Energy Agency has made that quite clear in its most recent energy outlook. Um, if we don't take the kind of actions that we need to take now, uh, investment will be locked down. And the, the kind of challenges that previous speakers and colleagues outlined earlier today will be uh, pretty much impossible. So in terms of renewable energy and the Irish context, um, 
The point I want to make is that we are not doing something that bucks a trend anywhere else. I mean, and Geraldine Tallon spoke this morning about um, the low carbon investments in the US and China and Korea and India. Um, we're still, we've made good progress, but we still have a very long way to go in terms of realizing the potential that renewable energy offers. And just on the targets issue, um, there are a number of schools of thought. There are those that would uh, dismiss targets as a, as a means of, um, of achieving anything. But I think the Commission's own analysis is that 62% of Europe's energy generation investment in 2009 being in renewables is a big contrast to where we were at in 2004 and 2005. Um, and I think the, the general sort of consensus that by 2020 it could be 37% of the electricity mix, um, a doubling of consumption between 2005 and 2020. If that all happens, then I am unashamedly of the view that targets do work. And targets set a political benchmark. They set us something to achieve. Um, one of the big debates in the European Union over the last seven years has been whether there should be an energy efficiency target. <coughs> and that's maybe something that probably will come up in the next session as to whether a binding target in energy efficiency would indeed be the way to go. The current direction is very much binding measures as opposed to a target. But I think the, um, I believe targets work. They are a means to an end. They're not an end in themselves. The policy uh, context in which we're doing all of this is as much about economic policy. It's about sustainable development policy. It's about climate change. And it is also about competitiveness, which, which brings us back to the point that Eamon Ryan raised this morning. Um, <coughs> low carbon economy, renewable energy is about competitiveness as much as everything else. And the European ambition, is Ireland's ambition, and it is also Ireland's opportunity. Um, people have spoken this morning about some of the unique characteristics and profile of our greenhouse gas emissions. We have another blessedly unique uh, characteristic, which is the abundance of our renewable energy resources, whether it is wind, offshore, onshore, ocean, um, biomass, which was touched on this morning, where the potential is, is, is really only beginning to uh, develop. So I believe in targets and I believe that the coordination, the increased coordination of energy policy across Europe is, um, is something which will continue to motivate and deliver, deliver change in the interests of this country. Now it was kind of, I know that Neil Walker actually raised this point earlier on, and I had just been thinking about this and throwing up the slide, just as much for people to be thinking about this, because there is a debate going on, and there are two very opposed schools of thought in terms of whether renewable energy incentives are actually in some way <coughs> interfering with cap and trade, with the price of carbon and so on, and that basically there would be a school of thought that says, you know, don't do it. And in this regard, I'd, I'd commend you all to pay very close attention to the, the research work that goes on in the International Energy Agency, um, which has done quite a bit of work on this particular issue and on a whole range of others. And this is some of the research work, not the obvious sort of um, set pieces every year. But IEA is, you know, at the heart of the evidence-based approach for all that we do in policy. Um, for all the members of the IEA and, and in many ways supporting the European Union. Um, there is the view that CO2 prices alone will deliver, but I, just some of colleagues might want to comment on that later on in terms of whether the discussion we had this morning and Paul Harris's analysis um, points to the, you know, whether the CO2 mechanism can deliver right now. Um, there are, as we know, very many drivers of renewable energy deployment policy. There's energy security, there's energy access, there's the balance of payments, there's environmental, there's jobs, competitiveness, economic opportunity, uh, and investment opportunity. 
And at a moment when this country um, needs that investment, I think it is beholden on us all to ensure that we create those conditions that are conducive to investment in the renewable energy sector, in the green tech sector, um, because this is an opportunity. <coughs> and when people tell me that uh, the cost of renewable energy incentives, that this is, is um, of concern, and there are plenty of uh, those who will debate that point. Um, first of all, I firmly believe that renewable energy deployment now and this is part of the IEA analysis as well, unlocks longer term climate change mitigation and reduces longer term costs. We need to take the longer term perspective when it comes to investment in renewable energy. Let me throw another figure at you. In 2010, $66 billion was spent worldwide on renewable energy incentives. In the same year, somewhat in excess of 400 billion was spent on fossil fuel subsidies. Now, I think that sum says something in its own right. So keep that in your heads. Now, delivering on Ireland's 2020 targets. There are, I must be frank, any number of challenges still. We certainly have not got it entirely right. Um, but I would hope that a number of, of, if you like, statements, and certainly when Minister Abbott addressed IIEA and indeed the IWEA at, at the recent conference, he would have um, sort of noted that the government does intend to produce a renewable energy strategy in, in the very near term. Um, a sort of a co-trailer, if you like, for the energy policy framework later in the year. Um, so we do need that policy certainty about direction. Um, we need predictable, transparent support frameworks. We need the refits to be predictable. We need them to be commensurate with what does the support, what is the support required for the individual technologies. We need regulatory certainty supporting renewable energy and indeed all kinds of generation in the long-term interest of consumers <coughs> and I appreciate that the Commission for Energy Regulation has to do God's work most of the time and I am always uh, in admiration of the difficult and increasingly difficult and complex decisions that have to be made by by SIR, by the SEM committee and it's not getting any easier and perhaps the point we've got to in terms of development um, means that the decisions are becoming ever harder and that is of itself a big challenge. Um, cost effective timely investment in grid. Um, that is a priority not just, may I say, for renewable energy development in the regions but for regional economic development. And I think it's important that um, business and, uh, and those concerned about economic regeneration and renewal um, get that message out that investing in transmission is about enabling FDI in the regions, about ensuring the robust um, highways, if you like, for, for economic development and absolutely critical for moving large amounts of renewable energy um, from west to east, from south to north. Uh, so we need that infrastructure and that message needs to keep going forth. Big challenge is around coherence between environmental and renewable energy objectives and planning and permitting procedures. But the coherence on this one is something that the European Commission itself increasingly recognises and kind of struggles with. Um, and I think, without exception, every jurisdiction struggles with it, that there is a kind of a conundrum there in terms of how do we balance the two. Um, and I do believe that is something that, that at a national level we need to invest more time and effort in, in trying to resolve. Um, Paul McKiernan talked about bioenergy, as did uh, uh, Gerard Burton and, and Kieran. 
what we need there is a coherent strategy and that's something that we have been working towards and, and saying for some considerable time but we need to get coherence into the supply issues the demand issues the environment within which um, we will have these cyclical ups and downs in terms of uh, uh, food versus energy costs and so on but there is if I was to see one thing that is really missing a bioenergy strategy is something that we are working very actively to deliver and I would hope working with our colleagues in agriculture and elsewhere that that can be forthcoming fairly soon um, I'll just briefly skip on to maybe some of those are all, and there are other ones, of course, that is by no means a, an exclusive list. Um, as I say, it is a collective endeavour, and I think one of the things that we do need uh, more of, and we would take responsibility for needing to deliver more of that across government, is the fully integrated approach across department agencies the regulator, AirGrid, DSP Networks and, <coughs> and others um, working with the industry to tackle the roadblocks that do exist in terms of delivering onshore wind, that do exist in terms of tapping the potential for biomass. And we do intend to re relaunch the Renewable Energy Development Group, which, which was, uh, became a very, very large forum, which is one of the things we're kind of working on to, to um, <coughs> reduce that. Um, we need to be best in the world in terms of integrating wind onto the system and I think the work of AirGrid demonstrates that we can be. And I would just note that successively from the United States we've had uh, Dr. Stephen Chu, who's um, Secretary for Energy and Nobel Laureate. We've had uh, Dr. Christina Johnson, who was Under Secretary for two years. And most recently we had Nancy Pelosi and a delegation of uh, Congress men and women, um, including uh, Congressman Markey, who has a long-standing interest in um, Irish matters, and indeed Eamon Ryan had met him in Washington a couple of years ago. And they were hugely impressed, and Stephen Chu was hugely impressed. And I think what AirGrid has done, and if you look at AirGrid's annual renewables report, it, it really does bring it home. Uh, AirGrid's achievement and the kind of cutting edge work that goes on in UCD under Professor Mark O'Malley underlines that we can indeed be best in the world at integrating wind. We will deliver the East-West Interconnector to schedule in September and that first piece of interconnection is critical to going towards 2020 and indeed beyond. We have the challenges of single electricity market design and regulatory decisions in the context of UK reform um, and how do we accommodate, if you like, wind into that regulatory environment? Um, and we have the role of state companies in terms of what it can bring, both in biomass terms <coughs> and also in terms of wind, whether it's sites, JVs, projects in their own right. Um, now, I'm just going to whiz down to one last slide and conclude, Chair. Can, I mean, these are, these are all very familiar to you. Okay, just to note that one um, in the context of the debate today. Um, and also, again, to note that when we hear the challenges in transport and agriculture, it does tend to come back to energy to supply the solutions. And energy policy as such alone cannot supply all the solutions. Um, but nonetheless, and if I may note there that biofuels and EVs, I again make no apology for believing that the electrification of transport is going to be a key and faster than we think uh, part of the solution to the oil intensive use in the transport sector. And I'll put money on it if anyone's on for that. Finally, and again it's, it's apropos of that, um, 
you know, I'm a historian by training, so if you go back into time, there are endless apocalyptic predictions about society and what's going to happen and so on. And inevitably, inevitably, um, the human race shows outstanding creativity and resilience in coming up with the solutions. And I firmly believe that technology will deliver, but it must be allied with visionary leadership and that, I think, and resolute leadership. And that is what the energy climate change um, agenda needs above all at international level, at European level, and here at home. And just finally, I want to make another point, which is there are 1.4 billion people in the world who do not have access to electricity. And renewable energy um, is part of the solution for them. They also tend to live in regions who are likely to be the most horribly uh, exposed to the catastrophe of climate change. Sustainable energy, distributed energy is part of the solution for those. And we must remember that climate change and sustainable energy is in that context as much a social justice issue as it is an economic issue. Thank you very much.